watching it. Yeah. Um, okay, so Jeff sent this paper out uh, last week, was it? Um, and so I took a quick look at it. Um, and well, this is a guy I met when I spoke at HRL last yeah. week, probably a few years ago. And he sent it to me and basically, basically said, hey, you know, inspired by really the work, the parts of the work you did on the map stuff. I think it was on that. Right? Yeah, so it's basically inspired by the SDR map stuff. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to spend a huge amount of time on it because it's not directly relevant to what we're doing today, but it's got some interesting uh, things. It's mostly uh, taking these uh, associative networks um, and showing that if you do sparsity, you can get better robustness and and uh, higher capacity. Is that similar to what you and Lewis are doing with uh, convolutional neural networks? You're basically no. taking an existing associative network architectures and adding sparseness to it? Uh, that's not what we're doing. I know, but, but yeah. in parallel, uh, analog. Oh, um, I mean, uh, yeah, there's yeah. A field of, uh, there's a field of associative networks. Yes. And so... He's adding sparsity. He's adding sparsity to that in the same way that you're yeah. adding sparsity to convolutional neural networks. Is that would be a correct analogy? E yeah, yeah, I guess so. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're doing it in a different way, uh -huh. but the analogy is take something existing, add sparsity, and see, uh, yeah. see what happens. Um, his, uh, the way he's done it, it's um, much more, it, it's very directly tied to the equations that we had, and he's got his own versions, <coughs> sort of derivations of those. Um, but, you know, he kind of <coughs> cites the sequence memory paper here. Um, well, that had the box with your math stuff in yeah. it. Yeah. And I'm a little surprised he didn't cite the the SDR math paper, which has a lot more uh, detail on it. But I don't know if he's aware of it or not. I can I can email him that. But that has more detail on the math uh, stuff. Um, but the basic idea is to see that show that the properties that we talked about also hold here. Um, and so. The way he's creating these associative networks, so typically with an associative network you have an input population and then some hidden population of cells and they're all sort of interconnected. And they learn to... I, I didn't think of it as hidden. I thought it was just an input population and an output population, uh, not a hidden population. No, it, typically there's an input and the population connects back to the input and wouldn't you're trying be, to recover stuff. Would that stuff. be an auto-associative network then? Yeah, I think that's these oh. hot field networks. Uh, okay, I think that's the what general he's general associative networks, you associate a pattern in group A and a pattern in group B, but an auto associative one would be either they're connected back to each other, like it's connected back to the input layer. Yeah, well, like in our uh, in our sequence memory, I would call that a type of auto associative network, uh, but there isn't even a hidden layer. It's just um, it's just the same neurons connect back to the same neurons. Um, Um, the, the way these ones, so this is a subset, I guess, of associative yeah. networks, but uh, it's sometimes they're called associative memories, but you, it stores a bunch of patterns, and then if you invoke it with some corrupted versions of that patterns, it's supposed to fill those back yeah. in again. Right. So but it's back into the input layer. There's no separate output yeah, layer. Yeah. So that would be an auto-associative network. And yeah. when uh, Tahoney and... and um, what was those original the auto associative networks? They first described them as a single population of cells that fed back onto each other. Right, right. So there wasn't a hidden layer. I see. Uh, I see. And that's where I think like our sequence memory is like that. It's there's no hidden layer. It's just a population feeding back onto a population. Yeah. In fact, I once did a little analysis about all the. I once programmed um, auto associative memories and uh, to learn sequences, which is what this guy Tuivo Honan did. And, and I saw how, how terribly unreliable and unrobust it was. And so I kind of lost interest in that. But then I realized later that our sequence memory is a, is a flavor of that. It's a, but we, did, we added sparseness, we added the dendritic elements, and we added the spatial pool. And now right. makes, it basically now becomes a super powerful auto associative memory. So that's how I think about it here. So in these pictures, he's showing one neuron. Well, it's an associative memory. It's not an auto associative. Well, it's, it, it, it doesn't, at least the temporal memory doesn't predict the same input it's getting. Yeah, it's predicting it's, the next one. Uh, but it's in the same space it's as the same, same space. It's, in a sense, it's an auto associative network because it's, well, because Tuwebo Cajonan actually said, here's how you can use an auto associative memory to learn sequences. Mm. So he, he, I have a book, I can show you who wrote this, and, and he showed how it worked. 
So he, that was his terminology. Okay. Okay. And it, all you have to do is you, his idea is you put a delay in the feedback loop. Right. And if you put a delay in the feedback loop, then you end up with a sequence memory. So anyway, these are off topic here, but I just want to understand what we're looking at. And then this hidden layer. This he shows one neuron here. Is there actually a hidden population? A population yeah. So the cells? yeah. So what he does is he creates these on the fly. So let's say you have some input pattern coming in, and you want to learn that. Uh -huh. He'll create. Um, a set of H new hidden neurons uh -huh. that form sparse connections to the input pattern, uh -huh. and those new that that set of H neurons represents that pattern now. So yeah, these are created it's on the fly. Uh, it's not really distributed in the sense that that H those H neurons are only supposed to represent that input they pattern. They will never be used anything else. So if I no. had to store more I more items, I need you more need numbers. more of them. So. You can store, so if you have n input patterns you want to store, it's n times h neurons you need. Oh, okay. So that's the, uh, so it's, it's simple. Um, yeah. And, uh, but it's not distributed uh, here. It's, it, so if. But these, there would be more than one neuron in the, uh, in the, in the h in that category. Yes, yeah. And you can, that's a parameter. In each, in each one of those sort of uh, subsamples separately. Subsamples from the thing. And then there's an inhibitory version of the network where, okay, so uh, let me finish this. So, so each hidden neuron here randomly subsamples from the input population and it's just binary weights. So it just cr creates these connections. And then they project back to the same input neurons that they receive projections from. And there's an excitatory weight. Yeah. So uh, the idea is that let's say with this pattern, suppose you only invoke three of these bits up there yeah. Um, these other four would get filled in by this neuron. Yeah. If it had, so it could fill in patterns that way. Um, I assume that the neurons in the, in the input uh, network are shared. That is, they are they would be active in different patterns. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then he has an inhibitory version where not only do you have these excitatory connections back, but you also have inhibitory connections back to the non-inactive neurons. Huh. So this guy is basically voting for its pattern. It's, it's saying, yeah. put a plus one for my patterns and a minus one for everything else. Uh, but also subsampling um, inhibitory. Yeah, yeah. It's, only it's all subsampling, yeah. Um, and for a particular neuron, if it gets more positive weights than negative weights, it turns on. That's, that's a very simple mm. uh, rule. But, well, with a threshold, sorry. I think he has a, yeah, he has a threshold as well. So the sum of weights, sum of the inputs is above some threshold, it'll be on, otherwise it'll be off. So it's very and similar. I, and it's a, not a dynamic threshold, it's a static threshold. It's a static threshold. Because you could do like, you know, and top winners or something. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's basically it. So that's the network. Um, the lear learning is pretty trivial. Uh, during inference, he lets it converge. So it, when you present an input, he runs it a few times until it converges. And he says it usually converges in a couple of time steps. So that would not be determined by like the learning rate? I mean, you could do... There's no could, learning rate. Everything's binary. Oh, it's just binary. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, um, he, let's see, he... So it can do stuff like this. So if you have a, this is a stored pattern, you give it a corrupted version of the input and uh, it can then recall this pattern. Yeah. Yes, that's a example. And then he has some uh, nice math analysis that talks about kind of the capacity of the networks, the probability of false positives and the probability of is false it, negatives. Is, your, is, yes, that, is, like, is that your diagram? No, it's not exactly my diagram, but it's, it's a similar intuition. But um, yeah. in his, so one difference between the way we do the temple memory is that we always create a fixed number of connections, usually, and whereas he has a probability of connection. It's um, not a, in my no, opinion, it's not a huge difference, but it's... If there's uh, enough neurons, it wouldn't make much of a difference, right? Right, and if you have enough... Uh, so on average, it's going to have a certain number of connections, and we just set it to that average. Yeah. So. Um, there might be some nicer properties with the probability, I'm not 100% sure. Um, so you can calculate um, so you did, a, you did a complete sort of mathematical, mathematical analysis. analysis that's really the heart of the paper did he do simulation too? he did simulations and he showed that the simulations kind of matched the math and the intuitions behind the math 
<laughs> um, and what he shows, for example, is that as you increase the dimensionality, you get uh, much better, uh, much many fewer false positives. So you get the probability of correct retrieval goes up. Um, so dimensionality is a, a like, factor. When he does that, is he activating the same number of input neurons or the same percentage of input neurons? Yeah, so um, I was trying to find, so he's not very, um, the thing he doesn't really analyze is the sparsity of the input. So in his thing, he always has 200 inputs active. Well, okay, so, regardless of the dimensionality, so, yeah, so right, the sparsity so, will be so going that's, down. That's not an unexpected, it's a very uh, easy yeah. example because... Um, well, I don't know if the machine learning, how uh, cognizant the machine learning community of this. To well, us, it's not a surprise. Well, yeah. So, yeah. well maybe, maybe the way to put this is two ways you could have increased n. One, by keeping the percentage yeah. active the same. Right. And the other is by keeping making it sparser. Yeah, um, I think that's one of the big piece of feedback I have is to explicitly look at the sparsity of the input as well. Yeah, uh, he doesn't really control for that, as far as I could tell. Well, he's controlling it by changing n. That's by changing n, but you can keep the sparsity fixed and yeah. um, change n. Yeah. Um, and to me, this is a pretty big parameter here. Yeah. Um, um, and he shows that the memory. Efficiency in terms of the bits you required to store the patterns is uh, quite a bit better than the hop fill networks. And I think primarily, <laughs> I'm not exactly sure of this, but again, I didn't read this in a huge amount of detail, but in the hop field networks, I think you have real valued weights. I think so. Um, he has binary weights, so he gets uh, quite a bit of efficiency just from that. The, what's the, the, what's the, um, the, the difference between those two charts? Um, what are you this is the, the... The bottom two ones, see, they look identical. I'm just trying to figure it uh, I have to look down there. Uh, with and without inhibition. Oh, so the inhibition doesn't seem to do much in that case. I think later it shows it's, it's slightly higher capacity. A and B are different, that's with the that's a, so what is A and B? A and B is... Um, with, this is with inhibition, so you get better... Yeah, but the lower charts, I'm trying to figure what the upper and lower charts is. Now, one is the number of input neurons, the other is the activation threshold, divided by the number of connections. Yeah, okay. again, with and without yeah. inhibition. Okay. So. Um, and we can look at... Um, with noise, once you start no adding noise, it's better with inhibition. So it can handle more perturbations mm -hmm. input. Um. So does anyone else remember uh, Yue once did his own little research project about sparse auto-associative networks, uh, the, taking basically hot build networks and making them sparse and seeing how many patterns can be stored? Uh, he, he did the, the inspiration for this was he pointed out that our layer two, three, our object layer, our output layer is a, is a whole lot like hot field networks, but it's sparse. Uh, and basically, I think he had a lot of charts that were basically identical to these. Charts. Really? Okay. I don't remember that. I don't it sounds remember. vaguely familiar. I, I remember him doing it. I, I don't remember him. I, I seem to remember he kind of stopped it halfway through, or yeah, uh, he had he had some trouble with it. I think. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I remember. I, I just remember it happened, and it was a lot of the same underlying premises as this. Okay. It's, yeah. It's just like it's all. I almost feel like I'm seeing the paper of. Wow. Of Interesting. Yeah. What you Did he ever? Put, we didn't put. No. Didn't, right. it, I, it I'm was, sure it's on GitHub. Yeah. His I'm code. Like uh, but I don't think he did this analysis. This is a he. This in this paper they do a nice analysis of all the. The, the most of the parameters here. Yeah, so I, I don't yeah think I'm sure his was much uh, less in depth than this. Like he was just doing how many patterns can be stored without confusion. And, uh, but yeah, this did a lot more. I'm sure. Yeah, but that is true. It's a yeah. Our pooling layer is a little bit like this. I mean, we have voting essentially voting connections coming in, um, but we can't directly activate missing inputs. So that's mm -hmm. one one difference, I guess. But yeah, it's very similar. It's half of this, so you're saying we don't have the back connection from the pooling layer. It's a little different because we have our feed forward input. That's what we believe yeah. in, and then we just modulate the feed forward input based on the yeah. inhibi inhibition and the previous activity. So I guess we have time, which this doesn't have time. Yeah. So that's another difference. Anyway, um, it was nice to see 
our stuff kind of expanded on and applied to Hopfield networks. It's, if anyone, uh, this was published in Neural Computation. That's good. Yeah, so that's good, and it just came out. So I think anyone who does Hopfield networks should do this instead. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's any downsides to it, so that's, so that's good. Yeah. Um, I would have preferred an analysis, I would have liked to see an analysis of the sparsity itself as well. Um, it's not just the dimensionality, I think the sparsity is also important. At one point, I, I, you know, I talked about the, that old uh, sequence memory that Quake Holland did. And after we did the, and I said, after we did the temple memory, I, I realized there's, this, there's these parallels. And, and then I made a list of all the differences. I said, oh, if you had this feature, you had these four features, and it works. And um, as a sequence memory. And, and I thought of writing that up as like a blog post or something, but I never did. Um, I said, what were the four features? Oh, I just have to go back and think about it. I have to recreate it. Well, uh, one was uh, we uh, normalized the input space with our spatial puller. So yeah. we, he had random, he just had like bit, you know, pictures. And he was showing a sequence of pictures could be learned, but the pictures didn't have the same sparsity level in them. So he mm -hmm. wasn't controlling for that. The second thing was uh, we had a mini column idea and, pred and prediction. He didn't have that. So he was essentially, um, uh, uh, he didn't have that ability to pick multiple things at the same time. And um, I'm trying to think of that. And then his, he, he just had a delay um, to implement it. And, and so uh, that's all, we, we basically, that's all we have too in some sense, but, uh, but at least we thought about how you have to do a real sequence memory, you have to add a, a time component. Um, this was so long those lines, I forget what it is, but you know, I just, because I spent a lot of time actually implementing that when I was younger mm -hmm. and um, testing it and, uh, and I just felt like, oh, I saw that connection now, but I didn't think it was really very interesting for other people because it, that work is so old, it's probably done in the 70s or something like that. And um, no one really thinks, that's, that's Quahomans work. Um, which is not, not as modern as this, but anyway, it was just interesting to see this again. In fact, in, in on intelligence, I wrote about, I wrote about all the social memories. I talked about it in there, ran the type of auto social memory, and good is that, you know, what good is it predicting the pattern you just had. So, and it was, it was a topic of interest to me for a while. This has obviously gone a lot further. Mm -hmm. I don't know, it's good. It's interesting to me, uh, maybe this is like a standard trick with neural networks, maybe a lot of people know about this, but um, it's interesting that it, they decided to, um, and again, that maybe this is standard with hot field networks or the more advanced versions of them, having a separate population of neurons that learns and inputs to, like, forms reciprocal connections to patterns, rather than having the input bits form auto-associative auto connections directly to each other. Yeah, like, like we do with the sequence memory versus, uh, you're saying versus you with the hidden layer, so. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, but we take advantage of similar, um, similar tricks with like our layer two, layer four um, reciprocal connections also be benefit. From, I, I know exactly why this network does that. I know exactly the kind of confusion that can happen if you yeah. have cells connect directly to each other rather than having this intermediate cell uh, there. It, it adds some fundamental benefits, and we get those advantages as well with our layer four. But, layer but, it, it, but in the end, we've kind of abandoned that feedback, right? Um, uh, meaning we don't we don't believe the brain does project back to layer four, and when we ended up with um, wait, and now no, I said layer four, layer six. Oh, I think layer two, layer. No, I'm talking about oh, I'm sorry, four, the, the four and six. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, and anyway, there uh, there is confusion that can occur if you have auto associative connections. It's nicer if you can have this other population of cells form reciprocal yeah. connections back and forth. Maybe it's, it's, yeah, it's because you're, you're if you if you have the same set of populations connecting back and forth, then you're kind of uh, confusing. It has to do double duty. It has to represent patterns that are seen as well as the current input. And this way, you're kind of separating it out. Okay, uh, but we did that. that we, you're kind we of separated out the separation of responsibility. In the sequence memory, we separated that. In the sequence memory, we separated it out with the predictive uh, element of the neurons, right? Um, I remember that the Cohonan network failed miserably because there was no way of representing a particular input in different contexts. There was there's no way of doing that. So if you had the same input, it was always you just lose your sequence. And anyway, so 
we, we have this feedback directly to the same cells, but they don't activate the cells, right? They just, they just depolarize the cells, right. which I think addresses the same issue there. I'm yeah, I think it addresses what you were saying. Mark. I think it addresses a similar issue, and then also uh, when you have dendrites, it, it also gives you. It's well, kind of like the, having the a dendrites. Yeah, the dendrites gives you the ability to, to, to do this prediction and also to separate out these different yeah. patterns. Yeah. Interesting. So and you saw you saw this between four and six eggs. Yeah, there's uh, yeah. Um, like I've considered the question of like what would we what would happen if. Um, what if we didn't have, I'll just erase some of, I don't know, my stuff. Um, uh, what if instead of, like, uh, here, I'm going to get rid of this top layer soon, uh, but, like, our 4 and 6A connection, like, you know, movement comes in here. Um, I've asked the question of, like, does this really need to be a two-layer network? Uh, could you just have, what, what would happen if you had the location cells, uh, just considering this analytically, not looking at the, neuro, the biology or anything, uh, what would happen if like, these neurons in the modules were themselves learning the inputs directly? Uh, and so like, the inputs to this cell might be like um, a set of, Um, making these neurons a little more advanced so that this population becomes yeah. unnecessary. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of new issues occur. A lot of new ridiculous things can happen with this network if you remove this top layer. Uh, there's, like, if, like, um, you get this phenomenon, like, um, it, it would, it would I, have, I have some slides I created the, to demonstrate this once, but, um, but you, you get these weird phenomena where, like, a, a super common feature can it sort of act as a wild card? I don't want to go into the details right. here, but there, there's all sorts of wonky things that can happen if you if you have this all happen without the two layer approach. Mm -hmm. And those and and those exact same issues have a have variations that would occur in this network if they did pure auto associative connections. Yeah, yeah. And um, and it's just it's a common technique that I wonder if is just like standard among neural network aficionados that this idea of having like of doing auto association by adding another population, adding reciprocal connections. I, I, I wasn't aware of that. Um, uh, as, well, and, and especially in this case, the way this paper did it, is they they were adding new cells for each new memory, right? Which is like if you don't if you want to get around that, you want to say no, I have a fixed population in the upper layer, a fixed population in the lower layer. It's I, I guess I haven't I didn't think about it as deeply as you have perhaps, but I thought about it in a different way, and it feels like it seems like that couldn't pop. It, it just wouldn't work well at all, maybe. Um, but I didn't really go into details about it. Uh, it's an interesting thought exercise you went through there. Um, it never occurred to me to think like, oh, well, what were, those, what were the good cells would learn? It just seems like you'd be mixing things up too much. So I have an intuitive sense that it wouldn't work well. <laughs> I don't have a deeper sense than that. Um, interesting. I'm trying to see if it's a standard trick or not. I, I think almost all networks I can think of that work well have it as, as a separated population. Mm -hmm. Like with, um, you have the autoencoders, you have the input and the autoencode and the encoding, and then you have a separate decoding layer. Mm -hmm. So that's a pure feed forward system. Um, then RNNs also, you have an input, then you have a, a recurrent population typically, and then you decode it out. You, um, but you, even if you were to impact the input, you would still have that separate population. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting. Yeah, I think the you get very tough capacity limits if it's all in one. Mm -hmm. It's like yeah. a fraction of the number of cells in the network or something like that, if I remember correctly. Like 10% mm -hmm. of the cells in the network, so that's the, your memory limit. Mm -hmm. Something like that. All right, well, that's good. Thank you for doing that. Anything else? Anything else? No, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna uh, I'll review the thing Tony sent me on Friday. Oh, that's even simpler. <laughs> <laughs> There's no math. Here. It's more of an opinion piece. Um, so we can do that then. And Marcus is out on Friday. Oh, you're out on Friday. Yeah. Um, and maybe it'll just be you and me and Matt online. Lewis. Yeah, Lewis is not here. Oh, that's right. He's taking off. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be here in robot form.
Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, should Thanks. I put that off for another time, or it doesn't matter? I just let's just do it. I'm just gonna jump to that because I want to. I want to uh, respond to Tom. Are you gonna write back to this guy? Uh, yeah, I'll write back. All right. Thanks. All right. Stop the stream. Thanks for watching. <laughs>